Remember, what makes you different? Let's go! Is what makes you Spider-Man. My name is Danny Dimian. Um, I'm the visual effects supervisor. And I'm Joshua Beveridge. I was head of character animation on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. My name is Peter Parker. I'm pretty sure you know the rest. When we started the film, we really didn't know what we wanted the film to look like. We did know what our inspiration was. We all loved comic books, and we went back and we looked at, at comic books to see what was special about them. We fell in love with the half-toning, the hatching, and the line work. We were really inspired by Jack Kirby's illustrations. He has the Kirby crackle or Kirby dots that he uses a lot. We'll see and, these dots as a motif through the entire movie. And a lot of the techniques or visuals that came from how the comic books were uh, printed, we wanted to stay away from anything that was um, soft or did not look like it belonged in the illustrated world. That included motion blur. Uh, that includes um, the uh, camera focus. So one of the great things about this movie, because it all feels like it's printed in ink, means that you could stop on absolutely every frame, and it's all clear. You can understand uh, what, where it's coming from and going to. It looks like an illustration on every frozen frame. This very first shot of Miles, I love because we got to do this one at the very, very end of the movie. Uh, we did that one specifically so late because uh, the song was being written while we were making it, so we actually started animating before the song he's singing to was finished. The motif wise, the goal for this this scene is to make him feel as like in his element as possible. That he's in his neighborhood, he loves this place and he's comfortable there. It's a very inviting uh, place, so the palette, the lighting, it's a comfortable, uh, safe space. And this is, uh, this starts to get contrasted as we go to his school, where the lighting starts to get a little harsher and we, we kind of leave some of the comfort of, of his environment. <laughs> New York is an iconic part of the movie. Yeah, and, we, and we'd really drilled into trying to treat New York the way only animation can. Um, treat it like it's a character, and not just the whole city of New York, but the boroughs itself. We treated like different characters. Manhattan was this exaggeration of scale and light yes. and brightness. The shot where Miles is leaping off the building. That's all it is, Miles. A leap of faith. It has an illustrated feel to it, and it starts with these models that on their own kind of look broken. All the buildings are portions that don't make sense for uh, New York, and they're yeah. skewed in a Bu way that- Buildings were miles long. They were, yeah, we had buildings that were maybe eight to 10 times taller than they should be for uh, New York in shots. They're also weirdly um, composed so that when you see it from the shot camera, it all looks really, I mean, it looks really cool. If you pull from the side and you view it through a witness camera, you can see that not only are, are, are the building very strange proportions, but the layout is really messed up. It's, yeah. it's really weird, broken yeah. looking. But from the camera, it's, it, it's an amazingly powerful shot. What you're seeing here is a test environment. Some people might look at the train, some people might look at miles. You're seeing the color shift in and out registration, the way that the colors might be misprinted if they weren't lined up properly. So it definitely puts one area in focus, but at the same time, it still avoids that, that lens feel or the softness. So this sequence is we called sitting back there, and it's really the first time we see Miles and his dad really interacting in the movie. That first shot of this run where uh, they're rounding the corner in front of that TV screen is a great example of offsetting the characters in the foreground so you can pay attention to the screen in focus. This one test shot, but one of the key things we really discovered from it was how much we could deconstruct level of detail at a distance. Um, if you look really closely, all of the traffic in this image behind that one passing lane is all just simple color blobs. Mm -hmm. And those simple color blobs represent a full city. Um, and it was a great aha moment for the entire team that we weren't going to populate it with a thousand cars and full of, of every single light in there. We took that idea and we applied it to a lot in the movie, including every interior. And so it's a great example of handling level of detail in a way we hadn't traditionally. I didn't have to have the team animate hundreds and hundreds of cars and characters and right. populate every building with people and just get that reduced later. 
it was color blobs. Um, and then we we were looking for opportunities to make things simpler in animation all throughout the movie. Sometimes, like even we'd have characters holding flashlights, and if you didn't see them, we didn't animate them. That concept became uh, the starting ground for another test. If you notice really closely on the bus that's crossing the scene, it's actually just a deconstructed painting. There's not 40 characters all sitting within that bus. We're also introducing pop frames in it where it's just hand-drawn and it's, it's really simple and it could be basically yeah. taken out of a, a simple comic. We're starting to uh, realize that we have an opportunity here to create a new visual language. Personal chauffeur going once. Line work is one of those things we had to solve a lot of different ways. It's amazing how much one little line for a furrow or a dimple can make you feel completely different about the expression. Form lines to describe the shape of something. A thing like a nose, the effects team did this amazing thing where we had the character designer make a library of drawings. So that was something we could make rules for. This is the way that nose would look from this head angle to camera. And we made a whole bunch of um, poses that defined that. And the effects team would recreate those in 3D space uh, with those rules of head angle to camera and then let the machine learning program try and guess where those drawings would go and a person would correct it every time it was wrong, making it therefore another rule. And little by little, we're teaching the computer to make drawings that we find redundant. So like an example like where Miles is scrunching his face right there. Usually with the characters like this, you'd have to be wrinkling the model in order to get this sort of crease. And it would never be as satisfying as a simple stroke. You can just have the stroke on top of it and it's far more expressive and we understand it. It's more clear. All that technology was in the service of allowing artists more freedom to do things by hand, and it all all, all became a part of this hand-crafted feel. You know, with great ability comes great accountability. That's not even how the saying goes, Dad. I do like a cereal, I'll give you that. Early on, uh, we realized that animating on twos was going to be a great solution for a couple of reasons. If you just watch it at speed, you're, you're just immersed in the movie. You're not noticing all these things. They're really sneakily hidden in there. But if you pause and slow down the same footage, and you'll see only every other frame miles is animated. That's what we're describing as on twos. You get that nice crispness, that pop art feel we're looking for. Almost every shot in the movie, the cameras are on ones. So we had to come up with all kinds of different technical solutions for how to make our performances with our characters on twos work with different styles of camera, always on ones. Oh, oh, oh. Uh -oh. So if we just look at one scene from the movie, this one of Miles running through the forest, um, you can see he's going in and out of sync with the camera. If the camera is moving at high speed through this handheld uh, ones through an entire forest, but Peter and Miles, they're both usually animated on twos, but we're going in and out of sync with them just so you're getting that sort of feeling of they're not quite on the same page. The real goal of this section is to make Miles feel like he's getting it. Miles uh, is not quite in his element. He hasn't learned to be a hero yet. He hasn't figured out how to web, web swing. Look where you wanted to hit! He starts really out of sync with Peter. Peter being in his and his mastery and this being his comfort zone isn't a big deal for him. The whip and release. So the beautiful thing about this sequence is we're literally seeing the two of them get on the same page. They start more out of sync and little by little get into sync with each other. And they're, they're even on different frame rates until they both get it together. And because it's I mean, on twos, we get to clarify that sort of posing and thwipping. Peter doing the iconic low center of gravity, spidey poses, and Miles, little by little, gets to get there by the end of it. And then you see them make eye contact and bond over that experience. And then you can see Peter glitch here. He's not supposed to be in this uh, Spider-Verse. And so all the, all the superheroes that come to this Spider-Verse from theirs, uh, they struggle with this dimensional glitching. Hey guys. Okay, who are you? I'm Gwen Stacy. Come on. How many more spider people are there? So we had to bring in each of the spider people from different universes um, and make them as different as possible while still standing next to each other and looking like they looked good next to each other. There was the perfect handsome Spidey. The goal with him was how perfect of a hero could we make him that was going to be a great role model for Miles and then take him away. 
and we replace them with uh, Peter B. Parker or uh, Burrito Peter. This fry is your universe. It's soggy, it's weird, it's gross. He's uh, no longer in his prime. He maybe should be retired by now. He's lost he, a few more fights. He's lost a lot more fights. He um, He's a reluctant mentor. You have money, right? I'm not very liquid right now. I think you're gonna be a bad teacher. And there's Gwen Stacy. What? It's Gwen, actually. Gwen Stacy is, of all of the spider people, the hero prime. She is the most capable and adept and in charge, but she's also probably had the most recent trauma. So she has a little bit more of an emotional wall. Spider Noir. Um, hey, fellas. He looks uh, black and white, even in our world. He never does get any color. He has the best one-liners. Wherever I go, the wind follows. And the wind, it smells like rain. Penny Parker. Hi, guys. Konnichiwa. Penny Parker was uh, the only spider person that doesn't have superpowers of her own, and she is has a mental uh, telekinetic relationship with a spider that runs her robot named SPDR that her father created. This could literally not get any weirder. Spider Ham, wacky Spider Ham. Yeah, he's he's the most who we're trying to be um, in our cartoon aesthetic, yeah. really trying to make him feel as hand drawn as possible. He's got a giant hammer that he pulls out of his pocket. Yep. My name is Peter Porker. Characters like Miles, Peter, and Gwen, they all came from the same physical universe where like the laws of, of reality were all somewhat similar. And more extreme characters like Ham and Noir, and especially Penny Parker, we got to push them like how differently could we make them. For the final battle, the, the, the wheels fall off. We've turned everything to 11, yeah. everything is going nuts. So we have this abstract world uh, kind of inspired by Kirby dots. The Kirby dots are not just an aesthetic thing. They're a nod to the collider beam, which, which is a particle beam. And depending on what's happening and which characters are important, the uh, palette is uh, shifting based on the colors and the worlds of, or the Spider-Verse colors of those characters. And then when, when you get to the uh, most emotional part where it's just Miles and, uh, and uh, Kingpin, and you know, this is, this is the final moments of the final battle, we lose all color, it's black. The Kirby dots are, are uh, now uh, just volumes of nothing. Enveloping them. Yeah, yeah. enveloping them. And it becomes really just about them. Um, and it also sets up incredibly beautifully uh, the contrast of when Miles finally uses his uh, superpower with the touch. You've now established this black background for this beautiful uh, strike of his. This was a special project. Um, there's not very many times where y you really get to do something new. It had to be bold, it had to be different, and that was a demand the audience put on us before we even started. Really, everybody held hands from the very beginning to try to do something special and to try to push animation somewhere where, um, where it hadn't been before. Thank <laughs> you.